Welcome to Amusement Sparks. I'm your host, Andrew Spawn, and our guest today is someone I know from Ball State University. When we met, he was the president of the Japanese Animation Society, so he's one of those kind of people. Uh, and so am I, quite frankly, but um, my guest is Tyler Trosper. Will you say hi, Tyler? Uh, hi. Good job. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the main reason why I reached out to Tyler to be a guest on this show is I remember his work with the Japanese Animation Society back in the day in college. Um, and, you know, people who generally organize student organizations are really passionate about their their topic. Um, and I know he's a passionate guy about a lot of different topics. And one of them, which I tend to see on your Instagram all the time, uh, relates to a video game that I had uh, as a probably middle schooler, maybe an early high schooler, um, called Zeno Saga. And it was really an interesting video game. I don't know why I bought it. I just liked the cover art, but I had never heard of it before, which is how I bought a lot of my favorite albums in like uh, video games of my life. Is like I have no clue what this is, but I'm buying it. And I made some amazing discoveries in my life doing that. Like I kind of missed that those days because now I have to like read ten reviews before I buy anything. What's your history with the Zeno series? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> oh well, I think it was back in middle school. I saw the review, actually, to Xenosops I won in um, Official Zenoblade PlayStation Chronicles Magazine, which times. is no more. Um, so I was like, oh, this, will, Chronicles. this will kill sometimes. And Xenoblade Chronicles. Saga became my favorite video game series of all time. It's got some interesting origins. Like, It's not directly a sequel to Xenogears, but it's connected and made by a lot of the same people. And then it's also not directly connected to the Xenoblade Chronicles, which I think is kind of cool. It gives them a lot of freedom you know if you're making Mega Man 11 it has to be kind of like the previous Mega Man games whereas if you get to kind of do slight spin-offs and it's kind of connected loosely I think that gives a lot more freedom to the creators yeah exactly So the first game in the series was Xenogears, which was created by Squaresoft, which was a... I mean, they're still around. They produce a lot of role-playing games, RPGs, especially um, ones in the genre called Japanese RPGs or JRPGs. And they're very famous for these games, like the Final Fantasy series. Um, Most of their games are really cool, and they really helped to popularize the, the JRPG genre from its early days all the way up till today um and i guess that the the creator of this series tetsuya takahashi is that right yeah that's right Uh uh-huh i guess he was coming up with like a script for the they were like proposing scripts for final fantasy 7 and he had proposed one that was like really dark and very kind of uh, Zeno series ish, and they're like, "Yeah, this maybe is not perfect for this game, but let's let you have your own game because it's still a really cool story." And I don't know if that was the story for Zeno Gears, but you know, it inspired him to like, "Hey, I get my own game. Like now, I get to really let my my creativity flow on this one." And it's kind of cool that like instead of saying like, "No, this you aren't right for this project," they're like, "Yeah, but here's a project you can do. You know, like why don't you do your own thing because this story is really cool." It just doesn't really fit what we were looking for. So it's kind of a cool origin for the series. Like, they, they empowered him, and that was a great, great success. Um, and one of the other really important key people for for this whole series, really, is actually Tetsuya Takahashi's wife, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if many, like, uh, you know, married video game creator teams. Wow, I had her name up, but I scrolled away from it. No, it's okay. It's uh, Soria Saga. Or, well, that's her her pen name. Uh, I believe her real name is like Kaori Tanaka or something like that. That's literally it. Nice job. But it's really cool that they, they you know, they work for the same company and they, like, work on these, these games that are so unique. It's, like, kind of their, like, combined vision, which is really interesting. So when we're approaching this as a theme park, like we just said, they're not all directly connected. Um, even within the same series, like the Xenoblade series, none of them are direct sequels to each other, which is kind of interesting. So for making them into a theme park, we get to kind of 
pick and choose what we want to out of these three connected series. At least that's the way I think we should approach this, because it gives us a lot of freedom, just like the creators of the series. They get to kind of pull from what they liked from their previous works, and you know maybe focus on what their favorite things were, or what they wanted to explore more. And we get to kind of do the same type of thing right here. It's exciting. Wait, that's kind of a daunting task. <laughs> it is a daunting task. <laughs> You're right, there's so much to put into these. But yeah, I mean, as you said... Um... Xenogears and Xenoslug are probably, like, the most related, like, aesthetically, because Xenogears started off as a planned six-part epic, but it got cut short to just Xenogears Episode Five, which is weird that they went with that, but... Yeah, it's it's almost like Star Wars, you know, how how it was just called Star Wars at first, and then eventually it starts saying Star Wars Episode Four, and you're like, wait a minute, this is the first one, how's it... Which is kind of cool because it immediately makes the audience wonder what came before, you know? Like, if it was just called Star Wars all the way through, there might not have ever been a prequel trilogy. But just putting in that little thing that says Episode 4, now it's like, well, where's 1, 2, and 3? I need them. I gotta have them. So that was kind of cool that their first game is revealed to be, you know, the fifth chapter. And they never really went back and made the first four, did they? Or is, there, is that covered they um released a um like an art book called xenogears perfect works that kind of like like vague details about what the series overall was going to be like but um xenogears is like the only one from that series um and then xenosaga well because the team that made xenogears left square um and established monosoft and monosoft's first game was xenosaga which was yet another six part planned saga just like Zeno Gears um, and it has several connections that aren't like direct like there's several characters motifs that are very similar to Zeno Gears but they've obviously changed some things otherwise um, Square and Soft might sue or something like that but yeah it's kind of interesting the, the creators left their their kind of home company Squaresoft that created the first game spun off into their own company and I believe were all three of the Xenosaga games created with Namco? Yes, yes. And then since then, for the Xenoblade series, they've kind of started working with Nintendo. So it's kind of like they keep moving from one shelter to another shelter, but making stuff that are that's sort of in the same vein or has very similar motifs, like you said. Exactly. Xenosaga started off, like sales-wise, it started off really good, but near episode three, it went downhill. So then that's when Nintendo bought majority share of Microsoft, and then they started the Xenoblade series, which incidentally, when Xenoblade was first announced, it was called Monado, Beginning of the World. So it wasn't, didn't start as a Xeno game, but it just kind of became part of that. Yeah, and I guess that was kind of a almost like ceremonial kind of thing from what I've read that that, you know, they were trying to do a fresh start. Like, hey, let's quit using Zeno at the beginning of all of our games. Like, it's almost like a, a crutch or something. Like, that's all we're going to be known for. But uh, then Nintendo said, you know, we should really kind of tie this in with your previous works because it's, you know, it's awesome and it fits in with the themes of these. So, I don't know. I think that's kind of cool that a company uh, respects the work so much that they're like, you know what, it's okay if it's kind of connected to something made by another company. We don't need to make this our own original thing. So, in a way, I think it's kind of cool that that the like auteurship, the the uh, creativity on its own, created by this this team, uh, has transcended the like corporate structure of working for different companies. It's been able to continue and kind of flow freely between there. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All three of these series, from my perspective of not being someone who's played every single game, but they all have uh, really cool weaponry <laughs> in space, um, some kind of Japanese RPG-based combat of some sort, um, and then a lot of times there's really cool giant uh, robots, which is something I'm always attracted to. Um, yes. Yeah, they're super cool. And, and they've been used to varying degrees of success throughout the series as far as, like, integrating them into combat and stuff. But from an aesthetic perspective, there's going to be giant robots, giant swords, and cool-looking weapons. And they're all sci-fi, would you say? Although they kind of all have sort of references to, to fantasy, the fantasy genre as well. 
Yeah, because I think um, the Xenoblade especially, but even and Xenogears as well, it tends to blend both fantasy and sci-fi together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Xenosaga is just kind of its own sci-fi thing in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I, I For me, like when it's purely sci-fi, it feels very like sterile and very like... Um, the Star Trek episodes when they stay on the ship the whole time, like those are very sci-fi to me. And then like once mm. you start, uh, you know, discussing things on uh, on specific planets and like you're more bound to planets in different species, it feels more fantasy in that. <laughs> At least to me, that seems like where those things kind of start to to change a little bit. Yeah, and then that kind of reminds me because like with the like the second Xenoblade games and Blade Chronicles X, it was kind of I mean it was more in in a sense more like the Xenosaga series is like mostly sci-fi but it was like on an alien world and you were like discovering things and so it almost kind of had a Star Trek vibe to mm-hmm. it in a way. yeah that makes sense and I'm not saying that you know Star Trek's horrible or anything but I'm saying that's that's uh there's like kind of hard sci-fi versus like sci-fi and fantasy are kind of different things yeah, yeah. The, the Zeno series seems to have these really large, um, kind of almost religious, philosophical discussions and uh, issues to to cover over the course of their stories. So they have super rich, very um, intellectual stories compared to a usual JRPG, which is just kind of like, this is the bad guy, let's go fight him. Um, this series really kind of like keeps you up at night a lot. You know, there's a lot of things to, to mull over and to research and to think about like, you know, God, like what kind of game really explores the, the nature of God as heavily as the Zeno series? Like, I don't know anything else that's gone this deep into it and approached it from so many different angles, but there's so many interesting things about the creators of the universe. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Exactly. And especially, um, cause at first, like the Xenoblade series didn't seem like it was like, as deep with its uh, philosophical themes, but once you get into like the beef of the game or any of those games, they actually are still quite heavy with their um, philosophical content. Like I, I just beat Xenoblade Chronicles two last night. And, oh my gosh! <laughs> Congratulations! Like, How many hours? Um. Well, I don't know if my Switch is lying to me or not, but it uh-huh. says I played two hundred hours. Wow! But um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of that was me trying to uh, get Cosmos in the game because she is a character in the game. <laughs> yeah. So, could you explain to us who Cosmos is? Ah, uh, Cosmos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, she's from uh, Zeno, the Zeno Saga series originally, um, and I mean she's this android that's designed to destroy this alien life form known as the Gnosis. That no one can really touch within our dimension. So she was, she's been there for, well, she was in all the Xenosaga games. But even after Xenosaga, she's kind of, I don't know, represented the series as a whole. Because even after that, she's been cameoed in several other video games, not including Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which just came out. But and she's also had like lots of different like figurines and stuff like that. So she kind of keeps the spirit of the series alive even when the series is still pretty much dead <laughs> so she's like the mascot like the touchstone character for for most fans of the series Pr- pretty much yeah all right so when we start thinking about a theme park like it basically needs to be um for the most part confined to one physical location you know like this series takes place over like thousands of years and across galaxies and stuff like it's it's a pretty uh grandiose kind of thing which i'm sure that they have to they're working with this you know at the disney parks with how to incorporate star wars when it's like this is like literally all kinds of different like galaxies and everything we have to incorporate into our existing pot like a uh, plot of land it's kind of like, kind of funny almost but a lot of the series is you know on spaceships and then on various planets um 
I'm really intrigued by the Xenoblade Chronicles, the first one. Is that the one where the whole, like, land mass is basically those two giant titans? Yes, they're yeah. basically two giant dead gods. That's so crazy. So I've only I've played this game. It looks amazing. I really have been trying to track it down because um, I actually do want to play through the, especially the Xenoblade series now. It looks awesome. But evidently, like, there are these two giant gods that were fighting on this, this planet that's all water. And then during the, like, final blow of this battle, they both, like, got frozen in time. And then life started to form living on top of them. So, like, a lot of the game takes place running around on top of these giant characters. It's so cool. These giant dead god things. It's crazy. I think that would be amazing to try to replicate that as the, the physical structure of a big portion of this park. It would just be crazy, like these huge, um, you know, icons, these huge, I don't even know what how to describe it, because there's, there's very few other, like, landmarks that are a living, or formerly living creature. It's crazy. Yeah, I think it definitely would make an interesting park design, um, especially uh, even in the Xenoblade 2, because it also takes place on, like, the multiple uh, bodies of uh, Titans, uh, as well, but yeah, I think either were like either Zen- those Xenoblades would make a great setup for a park. Xenogears and Xenosaga, not so much. Yeah, but... those those two would be harder to wrangle in. Um, although we could kind of have you know a lot of the 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 kind of storylines that you'll see in these series revolve around like um, basically restarting the universe or kind of alternate dimension kind of stuff. I mean. It's it's sci-fi, so it's hard to avoid those very appealing, very like fascinating possibilities. So um, it'd be kind of cool if we do, you know, like there's various dimensions. Like there might be like a dimensional rift, and then that area represents Xenogears, like something like that. You know, they can kind of be split up and kind of quarantined so that everything can still be canon and still be like kosher. You know, like this part is only the the Xenosagas part. It's not like Super Smash Bros or something where we're just like taking toys from different areas and combining them together it's like well here's this one here's this one here's this one i don't know not i mean we're allowed to mix them of course like you and i are the creators of this thing (laughs) it's it's totally fictional but that might be kind of interesting keeping them totally separate or making a storyline of where you know these these kind of universes are colliding and so the characters are kind of crossing over and into one another we could also just create a new like the park could be like basically a fourth series in the Zeno series where it doesn't have to directly follow the storyline, but kind of takes some of the motifs and some of the themes and maybe has cameos of characters, but is in general a new, a new thing. You know, maybe if we even go with the Zeno blade, like let's build this whole park on a, on a dead Titan, take that idea and kind of do, you know, a new, new version of that. So there's a lot of possibilities for like the foundation of this park. What what are your thoughts on that? Which ones of those uh, light up your, your eyes the most well because i've been thinking about it like um with xenoblade 2 because i mean it's basically several titans that are like circling around like a giant tree uh which is the world tree so i was thinking that would be an interesting design to think of for Mm -hmm. a part because like there's a few parts in the games like the party members are discussing like oh what's the nearest titan to us oh it's this time of the year it's this titan is the closest one to us so i'm like i don't know how logistically this would work but what if like in the park you're on this titan it's like okay what what titan is going to be closest to us next and we can go to that area of the park next but wow i I really love that idea that the way that you just described it so it's it's almost like a small scale uh solar system right things are just kind of like revolving around it yeah that'd be a fascinating setup and and just the like world building that that immediately adds to the storyline exactly you know it's it's almost like if if your country was always revolving around and so like sometimes you could visit spain really easily because it's like really close by and then other times it's all the way across the planet that's that's fascinating so as far as doing that on a smaller scale at a theme park i think that'd be really cool um it does uh, logistically, you know, yeah, that's a little bit difficult, like making huge vehicles that you can build attractions on and stuff. But I think, you know, it could be done. I'm sure someone's thinking about stuff like that. So yeah, let's just let's just go for it. I 
I have a question. Is it everything seemed to be kind of covered in fog, like it it looked like it was in Xenoblade One? The spaces in between the Titans are covered with a uh, a cloud sea. It's basically like people can like swim in it, and there's people dive into it, but it's basically clouds. Okay, so we could replicate that with uh, you know fog and um, just tell the people not to dive into it because they'll get crushed in the machinery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you know we'll we'll cover everything in safety nets, so if they fall off the side, they'll be okay. So that's a really cool idea. We can have different shapes of, of Titans revolving around the park, and, and different ones can have kind of different cultures on them, as I imagine they are in the game, right? Are, are they kind of se- segregated a little bit by what races live on each one and that kind of thing? I mean, yeah, actually quite a bit. Like, there's different cultures for uh, each Titan, and there's, like, different um, like weather effects based on the Titan they're on. Um, Because there's this uh, older Titan that just uses a lot of energy, so it's really hot there. And then there's, like, a a Titan that's, like, really cold, so it's, like, snowy there. That's cool. I like that a lot. And then (laughs) that does allow you to do the whole thing that, like, every video game has to have, where you can have a lava level and a water level, and (laughs) there you go. We've got it built into the story. Um, That's really cool. And I think, isn't one of the main goals of the the game to reach the tree in the center like that's one of your objectives yeah they're trying to get to the world tree and go into elysium uh, which is this promised land or paradise place at the top of the tree you know if you want to go to this theme park and experience everything that it has to offer you basically want to go to all the titans and if you schedule it right you'll be able to find a time when these titans are really close together and traveling between one to the other is really easy. You know, maybe we even park them there next to each other for for an hour or something and let people freely pass between them. And then basically you're trying to plan your day around a way to get to the world tree in the center. That that sounds pretty cool and that way you could get to all the attractions that the park has to offer. Yeah, that would be cool to give a like a, a goal, um an overall goal to I mean if you want to follow that goal, you just don't have to, but kind of like kind of like in the Xenoblade games like there's so many side quests you can follow the main goal if you want to or you can just go around and decide stuff totally it's basically the question of you know how many days do you have to experience this park like you can try to just do the whole thing like marathon it like you have to hit every titan and get the world tree and head all the way back out before the park closes or if you're going for a week you know you could spend take your time and like enjoy the titans that you really find appealing and spend your time there One of the concepts that's really, like, grabbed me and, like, made me really want to get into the Xenoblade series is, like, the blades themselves. Could you describe for the audience more about, like, Mm -hmm. how the blades, what those are and how they work? Okay. Um, Because the blades are basically these support characters that, for your party members, like, well, because it's, your party members are called drivers, and then they are are equipped with various blades. These blades... Um, you basically have to collect these crystals in, uh, in order to uh, like unlock them, and it unlocks a character. And then, the, depending on the, the character, they'll give you a specific element like fire or water, or and they also give you a, like specific uh, weapon like a sword or an axe or something like that. And they also have like some other like field related skills like lock picking or something like that, but. You have to basically acquire these support characters through collecting core crystals, and depending on your luck, most of the time you'll just kind of get random different ones. You'll you can't really choose which blades you get. That that mechanism is so appealing to me. It sounds amazing. Like I wish, I just I, I want to play that game. I'm like I was just gonna say I wish there was a video game of that, but that's the dumbest thing I've ever said. So I'm glad I didn't say it. Um, <laughs> but that is so. <laughs> Cool. So basically, you you find a crystal, and it it basically gives you like a new character and a new weapon at the same time. And there's a certain random element to it. So I love the idea of like the park guests being the drivers, where they're basically the ones who can kind of absorb these crystals, like unlock the blades. Like that sounds so cool to me. And not everyone's gonna have one. Like you kind of have to to earn your core crystal, and then once you do you get this kind of random 
you know, you randomly get rewarded with, with a blade, you know, like a character who can like follow you around and support you and also a cool new weapon. So I think replicating that in the park as best possible would be amazing. You know, they could be foam weapons and maybe it's not something you get to keep, you know, it's just like, you'll turn this back in when you're leaving, but that would be fascinating if we could figure out some kind of, uh, technology, whether it's like, you know, augmented reality or like holograms or whatever, um, to give you like a blade, like the, the companion to journey with you. And then also, you know, the physical weapon would be really cool as well. That's a lot easier to do though. Yeah. Pretty cool. If it was like, they give you like some type of like, uh, AR card or something like that. So would you get these core crystals from like different attractions or would it be like some type of, it could be either an attraction or kind of a combination of things. Like, you know, maybe you have a, you meet a character and they offer you a side quest, which is to go to this other Titan, find this attraction and complete it and then come back. And then they're like, okay, well, you know, thank you. You did whatever storyline element to help me out. (laughs) Here's your reward is this core crystal. Um, And yeah, that's cool. I like the idea of the, of doing a card because I think theme parks in the future are going to start losing something once it gets totally virtual or totally digital. I think, Mm -hmm. um, you know, having as much of this be physical as possible would be amazing. And just setting foot on one of these Titans and like kind of feeling the whole thing move around would be fascinating. Like that's an experience you're not going to get elsewhere on this planet unless you're on like a, I don't know, an ice cap or something <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's a rare experience to feel like the ground beneath you starting to move around. And like, not just that whole system sounds really cool of, of the, the mechanics of the whole park moving, man, I'm getting excited. That's really cool. <laughs> Okay, so Xenoblade 2, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, sorry, do they also have the the other race that's all, like, kind of robotic characters that you're fighting against? Because that was the main, like, threat in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, right? Yeah, but uh, no, because um, there's, yeah, there's not really any mechanical races in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Yeah, the races are kind of interesting here. I, I love when when JRPGs in particular, I feel like they do it really well, when they introduce, like, new races... Um, yeah, there's one that kind of looks like, um, I don't know, like a knockoff Pikachu Kirby kind of thing. <laughs> They're really cute little characters, really long ears, almost like Klonoa. Oh, the Nopon. Nopon. Yeah, Nopon. We can talk about the Nopon. Because they're actually, the Nopon are actually in all the, the Xenoblade games. Um, so, but yeah, they're, they're like basically the, the mascot characters of the series. Are they a threat to your cosmos, or they can no. coexist? <laughs> they, they can coexist. <laughs> so that um, was one race that we could have, um, maybe as like a walk around character. Like, I guess I'm just trying to think of like other like uh, kind of walk around characters or characters you definitely want to have available as as like NPCs that you can interact with. What's the one, uh, Riki? Yeah, because definitely Riki or any no pun. Um... Well, Riki or Tora, he's from the new one. I don't know if a lot of people liked the uh, Nopon character from Xenoblade X, so we might not want him. He, right. was, just, he was just kind of annoying. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but then, I mean, there's also some uh, mascot characters from Xenogears and Xenosaga we could include as kind of like uh, Easter eggs or something. Yeah. Because um, there's uh, Choo Choo from Xenogears, who is just basically a giant pink mouse. And then uh, Xenosaga had bunny which bunny was really weird mascot character why is that well because bunny like like from the front looks like a totally normal mascot character but if you turn bunny around he has this like really evil disturbing head face on the back of his head oh man so like you only see it in like xenosaw episode one and then after that they put like this like latch or something on the back to kind of cover up (laughs) <laughs> the fact that he's serving, I don't know if they're just start trying to hide his secret or what, but it was <laughs> Bunny is just a really weird mascot. That's awesome. I'm finding pictures of Bunny, but I don't see the back of of his head. Oh yeah, they. Oh ew, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that is so strange. Is that like yeah. his true face? Like, is that 
Oh, I'm curious about the biology there. Yeah, I can't remember if they were like two separate entities and one could speak and the other. I can't. I can't remember. I know there was a unlockable attack that you could do where you can summon Bunny and then he like turns around and shoots beams out of his eyes from the evil face. <laughs> and I just looked up Choo Choo as well. Choo Choo's pretty cute. Yeah. Well, there's this weird scene in uh, Xenogears where like Choo Choo gets like crucified, and that was just really. Whoa. It was like, whoa, that that's religious symbolism is really... It's interesting how how uh, direct they can be sometimes in the series with the religious imagery, like actual like depictions of Jesus and stuff. And like um, the time uh, period, like instead of being uh, BC or AD, in Xenosaga it's TC, right? Which is like transcends Christ or something like that? Yeah, that's... Yeah, wow. trans- Christ, yeah. Which that's really interesting. Like, there's a ton of flavor you can get from from research, researching and thinking about religion and stuff. But I feel like it's so rare to see sci-fi go straight for it. Like, we are talking about Jesus Christ here, people. <laughs> yes, it's crazy. It's, yeah, something when there, there are like actual characters in the video game. <laughs> yeah, right. It's strange. Yeah, definitely feels like Xenoblade's kind of dialed back on that, but maybe they're more. Kind of, they're kind of a bit more subtle with their religious references now. Yeah, and that might be the Nintendo thing. Like ever since like the '80s, Nintendo's been like, "Is that a cross? Get that out of there! Like, make that into like a plus shape." Like, probably. Um, all right, what other races do we want to include? Like, we need to, like, figure out a way of making animatronics or, you know, costumes that our, our employees can wear to, like, to walk around. Because the, the main race is Homs, right? They they look and act a lot like humans. Yeah. But technically they're not. What else do we need here? The High Entia? Is that how you say that? Yeah, High Entia. Very human-like, and then has kind of, like, wings coming off the sides of their heads. Yeah, they basically have wings on their heads. That's cool. And are they, like, decorative, or, like, can they actually fly with those? Uh, I think they're mostly decorative. Yeah, that's that's a strange race, but that's an easy, you know, like, you clock in for your shift and put your funny hat on, and you're good to go. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that would be really easy to do. It's an easy prosthetic, for sure. <laughs> yeah, because then, uh... Yeah, because in the first Cineblade, they didn't, like, have a ton of different races. Because they had the Hums, the Hyantia, the Nopon, and um, whatever the creatures on the Mechonis were called. Yeah, um, is it just Mechon? Mechon yeah, Me- the Mechon. And those were just kind of robots, right? They they kind of remind me of, of like, uh, the Heartless from, what is that game called? Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts. It's just kind yeah. of their, their motif and, like, the decoration on them is kind of kind of similar they're like black with this kind of ornate silver and blue and gold decorative mm-hmm. things like the the mech designs are, are different like the they're really kind of creepy looking like they have a lot of like spindly legs and stuff but just the the textures on them are kind of heartless ish to me the two titans from xenoblade one of them is mostly populated with uh homs and the other one is mostly these mechons right like yeah, the, the yin and yeah. yang kind of thing. Exactly, because yeah, because it's the uh, bionis, which is like the biological one, and then the mechanist for the like the mechanical one. That again is very direct with the the naming scheme. You know, it's not like this one's an allusion to life, and then this one's an allusion to robots. It's like, <laughs> no, it's me- mechanist and bionis. Like, get it? It's it's robots and people. I mean, <laughs> robots in life. It's uh, they're pretty direct, but I mean it's it still allows for a lot more thorough um, delving into the philosophy behind those things. When you can just like lay it on the table, like we're going to be talking about life versus robots. Once that's just cut and dry and stated, you can move on from there and get into the more interesting philosophical uh, story beats. This is just like an interesting little like trivia bit that I encountered that I thought was really cool, like. I guess one of the first things that kind of sparked the idea for the whole Xenoblade series was uh, the creator like made these two like sculptures of the the Titans fighting, and then from that it was like, well, hey, let's tell a story about these these two characters, and that's just fascinating. Like, how cool is that? That was basically like one art piece. 
that started the whole well, I guess the whole third series, the whole Xenoblade series. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, it was definitely an interesting way to like start something. I mean, and those games have really interesting settings, um, especially the first one. Um, just being like living on top of a basically the god, which is really interesting. Yeah. And I, I hope that we can kind of translate that into the park. I think that would be so fascinating if we could find a way to make it look like that. Like, instead of... I mean, it is basically just, like, some big robots moving around a circle. But making it try to try to capture the essence of the Titans in in their scale and their design as best as possible would be so cool. Like, it could be a really fascinating and just visually beautiful park for even people who aren't interested in this series particularly. Like... It's just a breathtaking series. Some of the design elements are like, holy crap, that is really interesting looking and really beautiful, um, regardless of the storyline. It's it's some really interesting design work that's gone on here. Yeah, exactly. What are some of your favorite things to like look at from this series? Like, What are some of your favorite visual elements that you want to make sure we get into the park? So for like uh, Xenoblade 2, like several of the Titans, um, depending on where you are, you can actually see... like like the head of the titan so if we could see like a large animatronic titan head or something in the distance or moving around it make it feel like it was more of a living creature i guess we don't have to necessarily build the full body you know it's almost like like puppetry or whatever you really only need to show the parts that the audience are going to see but but adding more details, yeah, like moving parts and stuff. Like you could kind of see things moving behind the the fog or the smoke or whatever we're going to have to kind of obscure the bottom of this. That'd be awesome. That's a great idea. One of my favorite places in like the first game is called uh, the Satoru Marsh. I, I don't know how the, I, you would implement that into like a, a park per se because yeah. it's just like the, the beauty, beauty of that place is just like at, when it gets nighttime and it's just like... There's mist all around. It has this really tranquil music, and the, the trees are like have are glowing, and it's just yeah, it's just really nice, um, like visually, and just it's very serene place. Which I don't know if something like that would fit within a park or not. I think so. I think you need to have kind of like those those like places where you can go to just kind of rest and like you know maybe get some food or whatever. That that sounds like a beautiful backdrop for for pretty much anything. That's really cool. And I guess um, in the Xenoblade series, like, there is, like, a, a realistic, like, day-night cycle. Like, you know, the sun goes up, sun goes down kind of stuff. So it'd be kind of cool if, if at nighttime, I guess in the games, like, the monsters get a little bit harder. So, like, things get a little bit scarier at night, which is something I really appreciate about playing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's, like, you do, like, want to follow your kind of human instincts of, like, going somewhere safe or going by a fire at nighttime. You don't want to be out in the wild. So... If we do add some kind of like combat element to this, it'd be kind of cool if you know the really hardcore players want to go out at night to to fight these tougher monsters, and then you know maybe the rest of us just kind of want to go be safe somewhere, um, just take a look at these like these beautiful natural locales and find somewhere safe with other humans where you can just kind of relax instead of having to be on guard all the time. <laughs> One of my other favorite visual elements is the Monado, like the the weapon from Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Mm -hmm. It looks so cool. Could you give us a rundown of of how that weapon works? The uh, Monado uh, basically has, like, different modes to it. Um, Because, well, because in the beginning of the game, the Mechonis can't be attacked because everyone's weapons don't work. But with the, the Monado... You basically can uh, like weaken that mech on and be able to attack them, but there's also um, you can like up your speed or up your strength. It like has different modes to the Monado, so it's a sword that kind of has a lot, tons of different abilities to it. Yeah, and it, it seems like it kind of like transforms a little bit and like it, it lights up different colors depending on what like mode it's in. It's mm-hmm. so cool looking, and I I didn't really realize this before. Like I've had. Um, smash bros for wii u for like a long time i never knew what game shulk was from until researching for this episode and then like i watched some gameplay footage of of his weapon and like Mm -hmm. the way it changes and i was like i literally never noticed that before it is so cool 
the that in Super Smash Bros, like his weapon actually goes through these different changes. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that was a really nice touch that they added. Yeah, uh, for him, Chulk in that game. So yeah, it's just it's just a really iconic looking weapon. It's really beautiful. Yeah, and I've seen some people like recreate it in like cosplay, and it's like, wow, you guys are really, really talented to make something like that. No kidding. And so I think we should put our best designers on on the weaponry that. Um, you know, any of our, our drivers who actually get, like, a core crystal can get. Like, we want those weapons to be, like, really top-notch, like, easy to carry, but also looking super cool and adding as many little technological details as possible. Like, if it lights up different colors, like, I'm sold. That's so cool. <laughs> do we want to have, like, combat in here? Like, do we want to have kind of, like, a, a, a LARPing or live-action role-playing kind of area where you can, like, fight some kind of monster? Or do we want to do that almost like digitally wow i know i just asked you a question but <laughs> that, kind of, that question like evolved into an idea of um i i've just been kind of like craving the the like mech flavor from from zeno gears and from zeno saga like the giant robots are so cool so this is just like an option we could choose from but maybe there's kind of an area that's like it looks like a mech and like so you climb into it and then basically like you play a simulation like you're you're fighting monsters and stuff so that might be an interesting way of keeping keeping the reality of the situation like if you want to fight go into that mech and then you'll take like a simulation where you go fly off somewhere and fight somebody so that your hu- you know your physical human body who's at a theme park isn't getting like beat up by robots like that's not what you want that seems dangerous but yeah, what are your thoughts on how we could represent combat in this theme park? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a really good idea itself. Because, um, I mean, uh, Xenoblade X, um, you could actually pilot giant robots in that. Oh, cool. Uh, which were really awesome, even though it took you like 50 hours to get them. Because <laughs> I, I love the idea of, of an actual, you know, like if I go to this theme park, be able to like carry around this really cool huge sword and like go fight some stuff. But I just don't know if the technology is there where we can have, like, you know, hard uh, VR characters that you can actually hit with a sword. Like, I think it'll either feel so artificial because it's just a, a hologram, so it's like, oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Um, or it'll be too dangerous because it's like an animatronic, you know, giant robot spider, and it's actually going to crush you and kill you. Like, <laughs> neither one of those sounds that appealing to me. So maybe for right now we could could do it in a more simulated kind of um, mini game kind of way. And then, you know, maybe in 20 years, we can update the park with uh, these uh, actual, you know, characters and monsters and stuff that you can fight against. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's maybe where the biggest disconnect between playing the game and visiting the park is going to be, is the combat. Yeah. Which kind of stinks. It's kind of sad. Um, although, I, I don't know. It's I'm tempted to keep trying and keep, like, smashing my head against this because... A lot of the the combat from the Zeno Blade series is it's kind of like playing a an MMO like a massively multiplayer online game where you kind of run around and like choose who you're going to fight, but but a lot of the the actual action isn't necessarily physical. It, it seems like so like fantastical and like larger than life, where it could be done really in a fascinating way using VR. Like if you have a VR headset on you swing the sword and like it shoots out you know all the cool like magical energy everywhere um or you can launch all the projectiles where the actual human's not in danger of getting smashed by something like it can all be kind of going on around you and still be immersive yeah because the xenoblade combats i mean you're you're kind of it's pretty passive besides like doing your like special attacks because there's auto attacks involved yeah so maybe that might be a, a, a way of doing it is is have it in VR, where you you know you put your headset on, you have your weapon, and then depending on I don't know if it's going to be like hand gestures based, or maybe you have different buttons you can push to control the different abilities. Like that might be pretty cool actually, and I'm sure that there's some cool VR stuff that's that's like sword based combat that we could kind of you know use the engine from that and kind of put the the Zeno skin on top of it. Especially if you have a character who uses projectile weapons, like that's definitely something that you could replicate in VR very well. I think just the, the swords. I want to touch the swords. I want to use the swords. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cool looking. Oh man. So 
So we've got a bunch of titans circling around the world tree in the center of the park. And each character, each park guest represents a driver who's trying to get a hold of a blade to help with some kind of storyline that we'll tell here. Do you have any ideas of, of what we could do to kind of tell this story that generally takes, what'd you say, 200 hours? <laughs> well, well, that's if you try to do like a lot of the side quests and try mm-hmm. to get like specific blades. Yeah, because I'm just, I'm, you know, if we've got like a big crowd, you know, there's like a thousand people outside the gates when we open, we need to tell each of them the story before, you know, within half an hour, you know, it's got to be pretty yeah. quick. Um, and we can tell little pieces of it, like, um, diegetically, like as they're going through the park and they are on this Titan, they're going to hear a lot of people talking about that Titan or its history or what the big threat of the day is. Um, so, but I do think we need to kind of introduce the character to the world that they're in and why they need to try to get to the world tree. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about how, how we could do something like that. Well, in Xenoblade 2, the main character is trying to get to the world tree because he gets this b- special blade called the Aegis, which is the main girl, Pyra, and she needs to get to the to world tree. So, so the goal is to transport the blade to the world tree? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's kind of a race against like this rival group that is trying to also get to the world tree and possibly kill all of humanity wow so so so, i mean that right there just streamlined the storyline so much and i don't want to like chop out any parts of the story like i respect every part of the story but as far as like streamlining it as much as possible so that people can take their the part they need to know and then if they want to learn more they can do that at their own pace like those people who really just need a quick little shot of story it can be basically you know this this blade needs to get to that world tree. And if you're not interested in the storyline, you can totally ignore that. But if you are, that will give you, you know, your, your entry point into all the quests you're going to come across and all the side quests. And, and the idea of that you need to go find these, a core crystal so that you can get this, this blade. I think that's kind of an interesting storyline. And so in, in the actual game, is it that just those specific blades, like, you know, the, the good guys one and the bad guys one, those blades just need to get to the the world tree? Or is it um, just any blade needs to get there? Um, it's mostly just the these special uh, blades because mm-hmm. they're, uh, the, they're called the Aegis, but there's a, kind of a good one and there's a bad one. Um, so it's kind of a, a, like a race between the two different groups to get to the world tree, the top of the world tree. Yeah. Elysium. So that, that could be kind of a cool mechanism. If, if we want to make the, the whole park take place in the same story, um, you know how the, the core crystals, like when you get one, it, it gives you kind of a random blade. Maybe one park guest per day will get the good Aegis and one park guest per day will get the bad Aegis. And they have to try to take it to the the top of the world tree, and whichever one gets there first affects how the storyline ends for that day. You know, I know that's kind of like melting down this this huge story into like a sporting event, <laughs> but I mean, there are similar things there. You know, we need, we have this thing; we need to take it over there before they get their thing over there. Yeah, well, I guess it would be kind of disappointing if like it's a like say 300 people get into the park and only like one person is to... yeah that's a good point point. and honestly the the chosen one probably wouldn't have that much fun either because now they have to like just you know beeline over there and there's i'm sure that they would run across people like other park guests are just like no you gotta go like this this isn't joking like this storyline is bigger than just you like i know you're the chosen one for the day or whatever but we want to win so you have to go do this we could find a way of kind of measuring a park guest's interest in the storyline in the series, and only those who are like, yes, I really want to play this for real, they are the only ones who are the in the pool, in the running for finding that rare blade. I like that a lot. Maybe it's even, maybe it's people who have been to the park before, like, you have to have been a park guest before, um, you have to have, like, filled out this survey, and then we know that you're a pretty diehard fan of this this park, and so now you have a small percent chance every day you come here of, of being the, the chosen one. 
also what we, we could do is put, maybe not everyone starts off in the same Titan and there's since there's different Titans mm-hmm. depending on uh, like there could be like multiple like two uh, good Aegis and bad Aegis on one Titan and then another on the other Titan yeah. so forth. So forth. That's cool, and and I had been thinking about about structuring the the titans in the rotation. And unfortunately, I haven't actually seen this from the game, but I was thinking of it as being relatively linear. Like there's one titan that's at the outer wall of the park, and then one that's you know it's like basically like a race car track or a, um, oh, no. something like that. But if we have them more elliptical, where they kind of like come and go, and like mm-hmm. you know maybe each titan goes by the kind of like entrance to the park once or twice per day that makes a much more interesting and dynamic park experience because if you get there at 9 a.m this titan is right where you can walk onto it whereas you know at 11 a.m there's a different one you can walk right onto so it immediately starts your experience off totally differently because you start on a totally different part of the planet of the the storyline yeah that's very interesting yeah and then maybe every hour, you know, you could have a new, per- a new like, chosen one. That's awesome. All right. That, that's developing. I like it. Um, the, the World Tree, is that a heavily populated place? Going into details would be, like, massive spoiler. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay, okay. So um, should we limit that experience to only the chosen one and their, their party? Or can you just go to the, the the world tree if you want to? I don't know about that because if if anybody could just go whenever they wanted to, that would just kind of it takes away the specialness, right? Yeah, it just takes away the, the 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 quest. Yeah, or maybe there's like a part of it that they can go to. You know, maybe there's an area where you can go to say that you went to the the world tree, and then there's an area where you have to be on this this special quest in order to get through and go to the top of the tree. Because, yeah, and, and that's a difficult thing as well with, like, spoilers and stuff. Like, a theme park isn't like a video game where you have to sink so many hours into it in order to get everything out of it. Like, I don't know. So we don't want to, like, ruin the story for people, which I think could totally happen. Like, there are very few theme parks I've been to where there are secrets I don't know about in the story. <laughs> you know, they're usually pretty pretty straightforward. But this is a theme park that could have spoilers, you know? Like, that's kind of rough. Yeah, that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know. And if we do, I mean, we this is like a, kind of an original story. We could change it. So, you know, maybe it's not the exact same Tree of Life. Like, this is a different universe. This is after Xenoblade Chronicles 2, uh, oh. where the world has, you know, the universe has restarted again since then. And this just kind of is a similar similar world. Or we could have, like, the Bionis or the Mechanis in the center or something. Yeah. Like that. Maybe let's just change it, you know, like not have the the world tree in the middle. Okay, I'm totally. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Bionis and Mechanis. It can be kind of a similar, similar beings. You know, it's another kind of Titan, or maybe it's just a really big Titan in the middle, like a a, a new one. What else were you hoping to include here? Are there certain attractions you want to talk about or certain locations, characters, anything like that that you want to make sure makes it in? Well, if we were like trying to like tie it into any of the other overarching series, I feel like um, I was thinking like a dining area area could be like the uh, like uh, in Xenosai episode one. There's the, the Elsa, like their uh, dining area is pretty well iconic for that series, but That'd be something if, like, we had a dining area. It could be like the Elsa bar from Xenosaga One or, or from the Xenosaga series. Yeah, that'd be cool. And is that on a ship? Like, where is that located? Yeah, so that would be the thing because it is on a ship. Well, I think that we could include ships. You know, if we have this like this cloud sea, it'd be kind of cool if if every once in a while, like, a, a spaceship just kind of appears, like. Um, and it could be, you know, through a black hole or a rift in the dimensions or, you know, whatever. Um, like these, these other characters and other ships could make appearances from the other games, 
which would be kind of cool. And maybe that one's just always there. You know, like this is this is a whole new whole new universe. It's not directly tied into any of the other series, so we can reference whatever we want to. True. So yeah, maybe somewhere near the middle of the park, there's just this this ship that's always there, and there's like you know there's dining areas in there and stuff like that. Yeah, and then like for um, another ship um, um, in Zenosar, there was the Kukai Foundation, which was like a just a city floating in the sky, almost floating through space, um, like well, like a space station or something like that. But there was like a bunch of like uh, like shopping areas and stuff like that. So um, we need those. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm not certain yeah. how that would work out exactly, but. Yeah, we could say that it's it's crash landed on this planet and it's floating in the cloud sea. Yeah, a, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it landed on a, the back of a Titan. So there was this great civilization living on the back of this Titan, and it got totally smashed by this fallen space station. And now it's just a space station with a shopping mall, and we can go over there. That's a little grim. <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's messed up. And maybe, you know, there's, like, uh, fountains and sculptures in there of the, the civilization that used to live on that Titan but got totally decimated by this accident. Wow, that's brutal. Um, What about technology? Are there any certain, like, pieces of technology that the characters of these games interact with that would be helpful for us? Like, because we probably don't want to just have, like, regular TV screens filling people in with the story. Like, we want it to be a little bit more diegetic or feel like it's within the world you know what i mean is there any kind of like specific pieces of technology that could be useful in our storytelling well in xenosaga basically had the umn which is basically the internet but um Xion in episode one could get like various emails um throughout the game but the the thing was depending on like what her location was she would also get specific emails in those specific locations so maybe we could tie that in somehow that's cool. And is this a like a computer terminal that she goes to, or is it something that she carries with her? Um, it's it's something she carried with her because I I don't know if it exactly was I don't think it was her phone, but it might be mm-hmm. some type of tablet or something of that sort. Or it could just be an app that people get for their phone, and then depending on what location of the park, like which Titan they're on, it gives them certain notifications about whatever, but from within the theme of the park. Are there certain elements of of these universes that you feel are underrepresented in what we've talked about so far? And again, it's we're taking, I mean, honestly, probably like a thousand hours of content and making it into a one day theme park. Like we're gonna do some inju- injustices here just by the nature of the the prompt. But I don't know if we if we're doing broad strokes, what else do you think we need to include? I can't think of anything right now. Cool. I'm I'm as I mean basically the main thing I really 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 wanted to have was something with titans because I was fascinated by those like landforms and then also the whole blade and core crystal concept which I feel like we got pretty pretty well like a lot of the kind of things that we've done on this show in past episodes we can definitely do here again where there's you know really immersive storytelling and like really nice little details and rewards for paying attention to those details you know, like the kind of like collectathon type of things. You know, if you collect all of these little widgets throughout the park, then you can get trade those in for a certain like rare core crystal or something like that, which would be kind of cool. Um, it also might be kind of neat to take the sort of modern arcade technology that kind of follows you along, almost like a save file, where you know maybe you're leaving the park, you have to hand over all of your weaponry, and they they give you a little card that keeps track of your character's progress. You know, like what side quests you've completed, what blades you already have, and if you've leveled up through the combat, it has all that information. So then, when you come back, you get to just resume right with that. You have the same weaponry and stuff like that, which would be be pretty sweet. Maybe give you a few core crystals on your way out, so it entices you to come back. That is a good technique. There you go. I love that. And and the whole like kind of random element of the core crystals is a really interesting thing i think people would get into it's like collecting you know blind boxed toys or something like 
I know this really cool one's out there. It's only a 1% chance of getting it, but I really need it, you know. What should we call this part? The series has always had Zeno as the first four letters, and everything else has changed. So <laughs> Yeah, it seems like it's a... I mean, it's mostly a Xenoblade, but it's kind of a hodgepodge. Yeah, you're right. It's almost completely Xenoblade, really. Yeah. I feel like our main audience is people who already loves this series, but I also feel like there's there are things that are endlessly appealing about this, even if you don't know anything about the story of the, the games. Yeah. Just the visuals of the place are amazing, you know, and, like, the storytelling mm-hmm. is really cool. World of Xenoblade might make sense. Yeah, World of Xenoblade would probably work best. Well, I think this sounds like an awesome park. I would super, super love to go here. And, Tyler, the audience loves you. Is there a place they can go online to learn more about you? I mean, I have a Twitter account at Cosmos Chaos. Cosmos Chaos, huh? So you really do like Cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as you can tell, I'm a huge Xenosaga fan. Xenosaga is my life. And I write articles for Operation Rainfall, like both news and uh, reviews for video games and stuff. I did not know that. That's really cool. I came across that like that name came up several times in my research. Operation Rainfall. What what is that exactly? It uh, started all out as a uh, kind of a fan campaign to actually get Xenoblade Chronicles, the original game, uh, released in the West. Because um, originally um, the game was announced, and then it came out into Japan, and there wasn't any like news about it coming westward. So a lot of people got kind of riled up, and uh, the Operation Rainfall was formed. It was kind of like there was like an RPG drought on the Wii, uh, like the Nintendo Wii. So this was our operation to bring a, a rainfall of RPGs to the Wii. That's really cool. I like that a lot. I've only been writing for them for about a year, um, so it's become like a source of information now. More of like a, a news site for video games and anime and reviews now. Cool. I like how this came together. Yeah, me too. It's it's a hard one because there's so much so much content to put into this. Thank you very much for being on Amusement Sparks. That was super fun. All right, yeah, it was really fun. Thank you for having me. Sure. Appreciate it. No problemo. Thank you for listening to another episode of Amusement Sparks. I've got a couple more five-star reviews from iTunes to read to you. Thank you so much for these reviews. They do mean a lot and make a big difference. This review is entitled Fun by Lilong2186. It says, a unique podcast concept that inspires creative conversation, which is definitely something I'm going for as, you know, the creator of the podcast. I love inspiring creative conversation. Like, that's part of the reason why I do the show. It's super fun. So I'm glad that a listener picked up on that. That's awesome. This review is entitled Unique Idea by Sir Jung. It says, This is a super fun podcast that's unique in its idea and execution. It's not just a mindless ramble, but instead goes into a lot of information for the background topic chosen for the episode. Give this one a try. So, hey, listen to Sir Jung. Uh, (laughs) I mean, obviously you already did, but hey, uh, maybe send this to a friend or a family member or somebody. Cool. (laughs) Okay, last one, last one. Uh, This review is entitled, OMG, Super Original. It says, uh, can't believe a podcast like this exists. Every show in amusement park is designed after a popular IP? That's crazy and I love it. Thanks, guys. And that review is from R2D Poo. Uh, So yeah, thank you so much for these reviews. Leaving a review is super helpful. Also, joining the conversation on social media is amazing as well. Um, You can look up Amusement Sparks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And we have a subreddit. Our next episode will be coming out February 19th, and that'll be our remodels and renovations from Season 3, which includes Nickelodeon, Mega Man, Capcom, Spider-Man, and Xenoblade. So, five awesome parks, and it's just going to be really cool to go back and revisit those. Stay tuned for a little bit of bonus content at the end of the episode. Have a great week. See ya.
back before Xenosaga Episode 2 came out, there was a uh, a game that came out called Xenosaga Freaks. It was uh, yeah. It was basically a, it had a demo to Episode 2. It had a puzzle game. And there was, like, a visual novel that, like, took place in between Episode 1 and Episode 2. And I've been, for the past few years, me and a few other people have been, like, working on, a, like, a fan translation of that visual novel. Cool. Sounds like a big undertaking. Like, fan translations are a ton of work. Yeah. They sure are. But that's a noble pursuit. I appreciate that. That's cool. Yes. Thank you. Well, I still kind of frequent this uh, really good uh, Zeno fan site uh, called ZenoUnderground.net, and there's a hyphen in between Zeno and Underground. Uh, one of my oldest uh, online friends, uh, she runs it. Um, I guess it's a good, uh, I don't know if I'm using the right word, repository of like all Zeno information from Zeno Gear, Zeno Saga, uh, and Zeno Blade. I uh, worked with a few people from that website to work on that fan translation. Nice. That's it's a really nice community. That is awesome, and I I love the like uh, fan translation community. Like that's so cool when a company has decided, you know, hey, we're not going to translate this into English. It's you know too much work, or it's not worth it. We're not going to make our money back, or nobody cares about this game in North America or whatever, and then a ragtag team of rebels just does it anyway. Like, Hey, we're just going to translate this whole thing, which is a ton of work. Like you not only have to like go through, you know, word by word and translate it into English, but you have to find like the message of each sentence that is spoken by any character in the whole game, which in RPGs that can be like hundreds of different characters. It's crazy. There's so much text in a, in an RPG, you know, it's like reading several novels. If you talk to every single character, it's just amazing. Like it's 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 crazy that people go to all of these lengths just to like preserve something that they love. It's awesome. And same thing with Operation Rainfall, you know, like instead of just pouting that your game's not the game you want is not coming out in your country, like do something about it. It's so cool. I love that. Very admirable work that these people are doing. It's pretty sweet.